I'd like to take a moment as well to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people um, of the Kulin Nation in which we meet today. Um, I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging and recognise their connection to this land. In particular as Palestinians, we have a very close connection to heritage and land and identity and we have a very close relationship with the Indigenous people here in this country and recognise that this land was never ceded and always will be Aboriginal land. In particular, I say that Free Palestine Melbourne, to give you a little bit of context, we are a volunteer community organisation that is dedicated to raising awareness about the Palestinian struggle um, against occupation and apartheid. It is an anti-apartheid movement. One of the things that we um, draw links to is through settler colonialism, and in particular the links of settler colonialism around the world here in Australia, but also in Palestine. Our goals are to act in solidarity with the Palestinian people's call for peace and justice in Palestine and self-determination for freedom. And in particular, equality for Palestinians in accordance with the principles of international human rights law and the right of return. But in particular, you may have seen us on the streets of Melbourne every single Sunday um, protesting for Palestinian rights um, and an end to the genocide, in particular, a call for a permanent ceasefire. There are many actions in which we're involved, in which we support communities and other organisations to bring awareness around Palestine. Um, and one of these events, this event in particular, is in vain of that. So thank you everyone for coming out and supporting um, Palestinian freedom and self-determination. Now, uh, to get to the, the main um, part of this, I'd like to introduce our speakers today. Uh, Nathan Thrall is the author of A Day in the Life of Abed Sadoma, and that's in the of Jerusalem Tragedy, which was named the best book of the year by the New York Times, The Economist, The New Republic, and The Financial Times, um, and selected as a New York Times book review editor's choice. His previous book, The Only Language They Understand, Forcing Compromise in Israel and Palestine, was published by the Metropolitan in 2017. His essays, reviews, and reported features have appeared in the New York Times Magazine, The Guardian, The London Review of Books, and The New York Review of Books, and has been translated into more than a dozen languages. He has spent a decade at the International Crisis Group, where he was the director of the Arab Israeli Project, and has taught at Bard College, originally from, um, and originally from California, he now lives and resides in Jerusalem. Our next speaker is Maher Mograbi. He is a featured editor at The Age um, from 2014 to 2017. He was the foreign editor of The Age and the Sydney Morning Herald, and during which time those papers, Foreign Reporting won four Walkley Awards, which is quite an accomplishment. He has worked in newspapers for 28 years, including stints at The Independent, The Scotsman, and The College Times. And he has lectured at Melbourne and Monash universities on the Israel Palestinian conflict and its representation in the media. So we've got some very strong um, academics and experts on the knowledge. I'd like to give them a warm welcome. Passage of the conflict 
a decision I'm told will be reviewed by my employers at the end of this month. One of the concerns expressed in the open letter was the importance of a wider context being presented in explaining the conflict to audiences. That context is not only a question of history, as important as that is, but also of concurrent discrimination and disenfranchisement. It is this wider context that our guest tonight, Nathan Thrall, ventured into with a 20,500 word essay in 2021 in the New York Review of Books entitled, A Day in the Life of Ahmed Salam. Those of you who are reminded by that title of Solzhenitsyn's One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich should know that unlike Denisovich's day, Abid Salamas is one of the greatest possible trauma for its namesake. Nathan has now expanded the story of that day into a book, and it gives me great pleasure to be with him this evening, bearing in mind, forgive me if I reach for a book at this moment, bearing in mind the words of the Palestinian poet Mahmoud Darwish, which he wrote during the Second Intifada, and I want to read to you in Arabic and then translate into English. Darwish wrote, أنا أو هو هكذا تبدا الحرب لكنها تنتهي بلقاء حرج أنا وهو Me or him That's how the war starts But it ends in an awkward stance Me and him So Nathan, in a talk you gave, Nathan, with Abid Salama himself, the subject of your book, and the journalist, the US journalist Ishan Tarur, you talked about your desire to write about Palestinian and Israeli existence outside the space of conflict. And this is something, as a journalist, I'm familiar with this problem. We have a saying in journalism that if it bleeds, it leads. Um, but you wanted to talk about a time outside conflict, um, in a space of mundane existence, calm, as people sometimes call it. Um, and you wanted to talk about even that in that time, things were certain, people's rights were circumscribed. Um, we're now in the depths of one of the bloodiest outbreaks of violence since the Nakba that created the state of Israel, and there's no end in sight. Um, the largest Palestinian city on the planet has been raised to the ground. How does your work get heard in a moment like this? Do people ask you whether it's appropriate for your book to be talked about in a space like this? How does, how does it, how do you forge a space in this much conflict, this much angst? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Maher, for um, uh, moderating this, this event tonight, being in conversation with me, and thank you all for coming. Thanks for to uh, Free Palestine and Melbourne. Um, you know, the, the book, actually, the genesis of the book, it comes from a frustration with the, the phenomenon that you describe, which is that uh, for over a decade, I was covering Israel-Palestine, and I would see um, the way in which uh, it came to the forefront of the news, it made the front page when uh, there was a war in Gaza or some very dramatic uh, event. And when that would happen, the world would call for a restoration of calm. And uh, what would happen is, is the crowds would die down, the war was over, it wouldn't be in the front page anymore, um, uh, people who were mobilized before would be more difficult to, to mobilize, and, uh, and it was as though everybody accepted the uh, so-called calm, which is a, a system of great oppression and uh, daily structural violence. It's a system of coming into homes and arresting uh, children uh, in the middle of the night, of parents helpless to protect their children uh, from arrest by Israeli soldiers. It's a system of land confiscation and home demolition. And um, there, there was insufficient attention to the daily lives of 
uh, Palestinians outside of the context of something like a war in Gaza. And, um, and I really very deliberately wanted to choose a story that would enable me to show uh, what daily life was like for Palestinians outside of something that could be exceptionalized, like a, a war. And, and has this made, has the war happening made it more difficult to pursue, pursue this message or less difficult? I think it's made it more difficult in some ways. Uh, it's obviously made it less difficult in the sense that there is now much more mobilization, much more interest in Israel-Palestine. Um, but but it absolutely it has. It's also made it more difficult because, I mean, the focus now rightly is on ceasefire and is on the tremendous death and suffering in Gaza. Um, but I feel, I fear that we are going to repeat the past uh, pattern of um, allowing uh, something that we shouldn't allow when, the, when this phase of this war is over. Yeah, and this is about how we define what is news. Yes. So, I mean, that's one of the things that, that strikes me. Um, um, I want to talk uh, next about the place where Abid Salama comes from, but before we do that. I was hoping that you might read a little bit of your book to us. And I'd be glad to. Um, so, so the book uh, tells the story, the basic spine of the book is a uh, terrible um, uh, bus accident involving a group of Palestinian kindergartners who live in the greater Jerusalem area. And uh, the town that they live in, in Atta, um, is uh, split half of or a portion of it is annexed by Israel. Uh, it was annexed in 1967. Israel annexed East Jerusalem and the lands of more than two dozen surrounding villages. And another part of it is not annexed. But all of Anatta is surrounded by uh, a giant uh, wall, a 26 foot tall concrete wall uh, on three sides and a fourth side by another kind of wall uh, that runs through Route 4370, famously known as the Apartheid Road, a segregated road with Israelis on one side, Palestinians on the other, and a giant wall running through the middle of it. And today you have about 130,000 people living in this walled ghetto underneath the manicured grounds of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, the most prestigious university in Israel. You can be on the grounds of that university and look down on this walled ghetto that does not have uh, sidewalks or playgrounds or a single ATM where the main thoroughfare for these 130,000 people is so narrow that um, you can't pass two cars in um, parts of that main road uh, going in opposite directions. And I would, when I would go and visit Hubbard, I would pull in my side mirror just to let a bus pass in the, in the opposite direction. You can imagine the kind of traffic uh, jams that these people live with, and not to mention the checkpoints that they need to go to, those who, who are lucky enough to have a blue Jerusalem ID and enter uh, Jerusalem through, through the northern checkpoint. So uh, I just want to read a passage from the, the um, book that uh, is after this bus uh, of kindergartners who live in this area uh, go off to a play area and they pass through a checkpoint and they're struck by a giant semi-trailer that uh, causes the bus to flip over and catch fire. And this is uh, the end of the rescue. And one of the important things to know about this uh, passage <coughs> is um, that the people who were helping to rescue these children because the Israeli emergency services Greatly, Israel greatly neglects the hundreds of thousands of Palestinians who live on the other side of the wall, even those who have blue Jerusalem IDs, are residents of Jerusalem, pay municipal taxes to Jerusalem. Uh, and, uh, and so ordinary bystanders were rescuing these children uh, from the bus. And the bystanders had different colored IDs themselves. Uh, either a blue Jerusalem ID that allowed them to go to the superior 
hospitals in Jerusalem that were very nearby, or a green West Bank ID that uh, prevented them from entering uh, Jerusalem. And so depending on the ID of the driver of these cars, they would go off in different directions. So that's um, something that would be clear in this passage. And the other thing to note is um, the main uh, character is a woman uh, named Huda Dahbur, and she is a doctor and a mother who works for UNRWA and is with her medical team on the way to a site visit somewhere else and happens upon this burning bus and stops uh, her van and, and gets out and helps to rescue some of the children. And another person who's mentioned is a man named Salim who lived in the area and heroically entered this burning bus repeatedly and saved uh, dozens of Nearly 20 minutes had passed since Huda and her staff had come upon the burning bus. Flames and smoke were still pouring from the smashed windows. Huda's driver, Abu Faraj, was directing traffic, keeping an open path for the evacuees and telling drivers of oncoming cars to turn back. The crowd had grown so large that Huda could no longer see the driver and the teacher she and Salim had pulled from the front of the bus. She was focused on the children, gently carrying them with one of the UN nurses to the cars that had stopped at the accident site. Many of the drivers had volunteered to transport the burn victims and stood ready to race to the nearest accessible hospital, which, for most of them, was in Ramola. The hospitals in Jerusalem were far better, but only those with blue IDs could reach them. A few of the dr drivers did have blue IDs, and some took off in the direction of Hadassah Hospital at Mount Scopus in Jerusalem. The majority, those with green IDs, went in the opposite direction, along the flooded road to Ramallah. Nearly all the children had been brought off the bus when Salim, who had by now gone in and out of the flames several times, saw that Ula, the teacher and his partner in the rescue, was trapped beneath the front seat and her leg was burning. But by the time he got, at, got to her, it was too late. She was gone. He carried Ula from the bus and placed her on the ground. Her nephew, Sadi, watched in the rain while a man covered her with his coat. In all of this, Salem had felt nothing, not even as someone in the crowd grabbed at his arm and pinched him. One of Ula's nurses yelled to him that his jacket was on fire. He shouted back that it was not. The nurse put it out as he went to climb back into the bus. The few children still inside were no longer alive. The last boy Salim pulled out was facing down, crouched behind the frame of a seat. He was still wearing a backpack, which Salim held to pick the boy up. Stepping out of the bus for the final time, Salim broke out weeping, shouting that he should have saved more. Somehow, not a hair on his head was burned. Abu Faraj stood unmoving in shock, as if mesmerized by the flames. Huda turned to the nurse beside her and saw that her face was black and streaked by rain. She realized she must look the same. They were soaked and bone-weary, and there was nothing more for them to do. When a Palestinian ambulance finally arrived, most of the injured children had already been evacuated. Huda didn't even notice it. The bus was still crackling with flames, and there was much shouting and commotion. Not a single firefighter, police officer, or soldier had come. Huda wanted to follow the children, she found her team, and they returned to the Unra van. Nida, the pregnant pharmacist, was still inside, inconsolable. Abu Faraj started dropping off everyone at home as Huda called around and confirmed that most of the children were in Ramallah. Then she phoned her Unra supervisor. He didn't understand the magnitude of the accident and demanded that the team turn around and go to Hanul Ahmar, where he would cut their pay. Huda refused and said he should just cut just her salary no one else's. After stopping for a quick shower, Huda set off for the hospital, taking the clinic social worker with her. When they got there, word spread that Huda had been at the crash. A great many parents and other relatives sought her out, asking whether she had seen a boy with a Spider-Man backpack, a girl with her hair in yellow ribbons. Huda told them all the same thing. The children had been covered in soot, and she couldn't tell what they were wearing. 
Going from room to room, Buddha checked on the injured children, soothing them. Since leaving the bus, she had felt something nagging at her. She was sure the kindergartners had been silent, at least early in their ordeal. Now, at the bed of one girl, Buddha asked her why that was, why she had heard no sound. We were so scared, the girl said. When we saw the flames, we thought we had died. We thought we were in hell. So, Huda worked for Unawa. Yeah. This is the same Unawa that can't be funded because it's full of suspect foods. Um, so, how did you? How did you come to choose the road accident? How did you come across the road accident? How did you encounter that incident? I mean, because you weren't there, it, it must have, you know, you were, were you looking for such a thing? Or did it just kind of impinge on your consciousness in some other way? Yeah. Um, well, it did in, impinge on my consciousness. I, I was driving to Hebron that day with a Palestinian colleague, and we heard on the radio about the crash, and. Um, you know, these are people who reside in the same city as me, and it was a, a horrific uh, tragedy that was emblematic of the utter neglect in which these people, hundreds of thousands of people, live. The Palestinian Authority isn't allowed into this enclave or to the site of the accident, because it's uh, the site of the accident is what is known as Area C, which is the more than 60% of the West Bank that's under full Israeli control. Uh, not just security control, but full Israeli administration. And that means that the Palestinian Authority, which is limited to 165 small little uh, islands of uh, semi-autonomy, uh, cannot uh, go to, to the um, to Area C or to where this crash was. Um, so I felt that the crash was um, um, emblematic and that it would allow me to tell the story of Israel-Palestine through these parents and children and teachers, and also um, uh, through the founder of a, of a settlement just adjacent to where it happened, the man who uh, was responsible for creating uh, the wall, uh, for choosing the route of the wall, who also happened to be the one who divided the West Bank up into area A, B, and C uh, on a map. Oh, okay. And, um, but, uh, there is another uh, way in which I came to the to the uh, crash, which was that um, I initially meant to write an article, and um, at the time that I was writing the article, there was a there was a uh, debate raging in uh, Israel about uh, the annexation of parts of the West Bank, which the Prime Minister Netanyahu had said he would undertake shortly with the backing of the, um, by, uh, sorry, the, the Trump administration. And, um, and this debate, I felt, was, was founded on false premises. And the debate was essentially between uh, those Israelis on the right who supported uh, annexation and the Israeli center left, which uh, was tearing its hair out about how this annexation would be uh, not just self-defeating, but the uh, end of Zionism, the worst disaster to befall uh, the state, uh, the beginning of total isolation uh, by the world, etc. cetera. And, and what I felt that that debate missed was the degree to which um, large, certainly the settlements and, and the West Bank as a whole had been annexed de facto uh, already. And I wanted to illustrate that narratively. I wanted to show, later I wrote an analytical article for the London Review of Books called The Separate Regime's Delusion, which is all about um, how this myth is perpetuated, that there's a good uh, democratic Israel inside the pre-1967 borders, and then there's the uh, temporary occupation that is outside uh, of Israel's uh, control, and we don't consider that part of Israel, and this is how this fundamental illusion is how we continue to call Israel a democracy. Um, it's a single state controlling seven million Jews and seven million Palestinians. The vast majority of those Palestinians don't have basic civil rights. But if you create this construct, 
that there is a democratic Israel within the pre-1967 borders, and it's entirely separate from anything outside the 67 borders, then it's much easier to believe that Israel's a democracy, never mind that the um, 700,000 Israeli Jews living beyond the 67 borders uh, in settlements are voting in Israeli elections from those settlements. Our Supreme Court justices are working in the Israeli government and in high-tech firms, and they have police stations and uh, uh, fire trucks and the same street signs and highways leading seamlessly into Israel. So, you know, you drive around and this place has been annexed. You walk in a settlement. It's Israel. Yeah. And and so I wanted to. Sh I was looking for stories that were located in a place that would really illustrate uh, the absurdity of the annexation debate. And there are a few different options, but one of them were places that had been annexed already, but were utterly neglected and treated like the rest of the West like Bank, Anadha. like Anadha. So recently you appeared on the ABC's Q&A show, uh, show I don't watch, out uh, of respect for my own blood pressure. <laughs> <laughs> I do read the transcript afterwards, <laughs> but that's, that's the extent of my engagement with Q&A as a show. Um, and you set out some of the situation as you see it on that show in the brief time you were given. And um, also on the panel with you was the Liberal MP for Menzies, uh, Mr. Keith Wallahan. And Keith felt the need after you had finished speaking to kind of add to what you had said. Um, and basically what Keith said was that the line of discussion you had pursued couldn't lead to peace, um, basically because it, it, it called into question the existence of Israel. And this is something which anyone here who has ever debated this on a street corner, in a pub, on the floor of parliament, is familiar with, which is that whenever you call for Palestinian rights to be realized, you are told that the way Israel is, is the way it has to be um, in order for Jewish Israelis to survive. Um, you live in Jerusalem. What do you say to people who say, well, but Israel has a right to exist, and this is its existence, and this is how it exists? What do you say to those people? I mean, the very, the very short answer is, uh, Israel doesn't have a right to exist as a state dominating uh, another group of people. Um, that, that isn't uh, a right that any, any state has. And, um, and, and you know, I, I, Keith Wallahan has said that in response to my discussion of apartheid, and that uh, there were, I was mentioning how many um, international human rights organizations and the United Nations had found that Israel is practicing apartheid, and even former uh, ministers in Israel have said Israel is practicing apartheid. The highest legal authority in Israel, the former attorney general, has said Israel is practicing apartheid. Uh, but I didn't say apartheid in the West Bank. And so I understood Keith Wallahan to be responding to the fact that I didn't limit myself because as I mentioned, I don't believe in this distinction between uh, the uh, good uh, Israel and the bad occupation. And it's the Israeli government that is uh, implementing uh, the occupation and, and, and the uh, domination doesn't, isn't limited to the occupation either. It exists in uh, Israel in its pre-1967 borders in different forms. It's, it's a, a variegated system. The, the way that rights are deprived in Gaza is different than the way that rights are deprived in East Jerusalem. It's different than the way that rights are deprived in the West Bank. It's different than the way rights are deprived to refugees. Uh, and and so you know the, the 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 basic answer is you know when when uh, we had apartheid in South Africa and people were calling for an end to uh, apartheid in South Africa. Were they calling for the eradication of South Africa or for South Africa to cease to exist? No, they were calling for the end of this system of domination.
you can clap. <laughs> um, I'm going to rephrase this question that I had next slightly, but I'm going to start by saying um, that most Palestinians, and I think probably a lot of people in this room, but we'll see, understand America and the American Jewish community, which stretches, as you know, from Sheldon Davidson over to Chuck Schumer. Um, as the chief guardians of the state of Israel in its current political path. And I mean, I think, in fact, Chuck Schumer's, Chuck Schumer's name, Shomer, comes from the Hebrew word for God, and he has made this analogy before. He said, I'm a God for Israel. Um, now, without wanting to labor the point, Nathan, you're an American, you're Jewish. You came to Jerusalem on the bus bike trip. How did you end up where you are now? <laughs> uh, I, I was, you know, uh, supremely ignorant. Uh, I knew nothing at the time that I uh, took that trip. And I, um, I read, and, um, and then I started to report, and I saw um, uh, things with my own eyes. And it was uh, very clear to me that um, that this was a, a, an unjust and intolerable uh, system that is entirely supported by uh, the United States and its allies. Mm. Mm. And do you think, how, I mean, how do you relate to people back home who still support what's going on in this unswerving kind of way? How do you have, I mean, how does that conversation start for you? I mean, Obviously, it's not a pleasant conversation always, but I mean, you know, you presumably run into people who you knew who are still in that camp, and you left that camp, as it were. I mean, I don't think about necessarily all people as tribes, yeah. but you know, you were part of a group of people who would have had like minded assumptions about Israel, and you deviated in a way, if you want to call it that. How did you, how, did, how does that encounter go? So, um, I'm, I'm, I think I'm a little bit different than the kind of stereotypical case of American Jew who's awakened to the realities uh, on the ground because um, I wasn't really a part of that uh, organized pro-Israel Jewish community prior to going on this trip. It was a fluke that I went on this birthright trip. I had never even heard of birthright before I went on it. And, um, and you know, I, I've lived for, um, you know, over 13 years in uh, Jerusalem and spent a lot of time in Gaza and the West Bank. And, and so um, I see that the conversation in the diaspora is, is really even among those who are awakening to, to um, truths that have been hidden from them. I feel like it's really uh, ignorant in many ways. And, and part of the aim of this book was to give them a kind of narrative tour of, of the reality in, in Israel, uh, of Palestine. But I, I also, I, I really, um, I've always avoided talking about my own identity. I don't like to uh, foreground uh, that. I've always wanted the story to be about my subjects, which are the, uh, mostly it's the Palestinians who are, who are living under uh, Israeli control. And, um, and I've always felt that it was kind of a distraction and that it would be used to, um, you know, when you can't win the argument, you discredit the messenger. And so in any kind of detail you give about your identity, you can be attacked from any side. Oh, we don't have to listen to him because X, rather than keeping it about the substance of what somebody is actually saying. And more than that, I would say that, I, you know, I, I feel a kind of alienation from uh, large parts of that um, diaspora Jewish conversation um, because I, I think there is a kind of a navel gazing element to it, which um, is, you know, I, there's a whole genre of articles that I call, uh, this may not uh, uh, resonate in Australia, but that, that I call, uh, You Lied to Me at Camp Ramah. And Camp Ramah was like the, um, you know, the, the summer Zionist Jewish camp that so many of these young people went to. And they write an article about their awakening to all the lies that they were told, and they're so outraged. And the tenor of many of these articles is, you know, 
almost as though they have more anger toward their leaders for, to, for lying to them than they do for the thing that they were lied to about. They should be outraged about what's happening to Palestinians and not foregrounding themselves as victims of having been lied to. So I just in many ways, I'm a poor spokesperson for the um, American Jewish left. Very good. I want, do you think people should do the first right trip, or do you think they should find other ways? Oh, I, I absolutely think they should not. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's no question about it. I mean, the whole, the whole, the whole premise of it is, is, uh, is uh, absurd. The title of it is absurd. I mean, um, to, to have a, a birthright to come and visit when millions of Palestinians uh, can't uh, do that is uh, outrageous. Now, I'm going to let people into a secret, which is that you told me before we came in here that you you were determined, it's not a big secret, you were determined that your book shouldn't be didactic. And I think this is very important. Um, I think it's very important that when we tell, um, as a journalist myself, that when we tell people stories, we allow people to speak through the story, that we don't try and shape it to our own ends. Um, but having said that, I think that at this moment, perhaps more than even any other, people wonder, where do we go from here? Um, when people read your book, and they read about what Abid and people like Abid and Huda and Abu Faraj go through, you then ask, your, I think it's a natural human impulse to ask yourself, what would a better future look like for those people? What do you think a better future would look like for those people? I mean, a future, because we've already talked about existence of Israel and how Israel exists, which is to me an important question. Um, when people, when campaigners, when activists here say, from the river to the sea, mm -hmm. Palestine will be free, there are people in the public sphere who go, <gasps> <laughs> what are you saying? So we need to address this seriously. What, what, what is a future, what is a future that is healthy for Ab Abid and Huda and Abid Faraj, but is also healthy for the rest of the society going to the club? So on the, on the first part of your question, um, it's really it's a work of narrative nonfiction, and I'm trying to show the world through the eyes of the characters, and at no point uh, do I weigh in with my um, views, or certainly not prescriptions, of, or anything of the kind. Uh, when, when you finish the narrative, you are, um, I, the aim is that you will feel uh, that this is an, a moral catastrophe, um, and you will feel the deep, deep injustice of it, but um, it doesn't go into any kind of discussion of one state and two states and things of that, that kind. Um, though to some degree that, that it, you do see it in the fact that Abed uh, was opposed to Oslo, he knew that it would make his life even worse, that the restrictions would grow, he was right in all of those predictions. But um, again, it's, it's really it's through the eyes of the characters. As for me, you know, for many years I have, um, I've usually avoided in answering questions about uh, one state versus two state. Um, and it's not because I don't have a, a preference. Uh, it's obvious to me that, um, you know, if you have not even counting Palestinian refugees, but just under Israel's control, you have seven million Jews and seven million Palestinians, and the supposedly just solution is that you give half of the people 22% of their uh, homeland to big Bantu sons that are, uh, have hopefully some kind of connection to one another, and it's you know not real, really a sovereign state, and it doesn't have a control over its external borders, and on and on and on. I don't think any person, any sane person, could call that, that a just uh, outcome. Um, 
However, more important than that, the real reason that I, I, I didn't like answering it is because I felt that the whole one state, two state debate was a distraction. Mm -hmm. Neither of these things are happening. Uh, not one state and not two state. And the whole debate is premised on the notion that somebody has a gun to Israel's head right now and is saying, you're dominating the Palestinians, give them a sovereign state or equal rights. One or the other, choose. Sovereignty or citizenship, give them one. And that's absolutely not the case. No, that gun does not exist. Israel says, I prefer option three. I prefer to continue this system indefinitely. And yes, it's true, I don't really have a great plan for what's gonna happen with the millions of Palestinians under my control and their you know, more horrific and less horrific versions of their future, um, but, but my preference is to continue this and nobody is putting that gun to Israel's head and so the choice isn't going to happen. So we can sit here and debate this all day long. Meanwhile, Israel is slowly gobbling up the West Bank, settlements are expanding. We're sitting here debating one state versus two. As I mean, we might as well be debating, you know, like the, you know, what the town hall in our future utopia should look like. And, uh, and it's coming at the expense of drawing attention to uh, daily uh, uh, land grabs, <clears throat> daily detention of uh, uh, children, and you know, holding people indefinitely in administrative detention without trial or charge. Um, you know, these are the realities that we should be focused on. And I do think it's important to have principles. We can have principles that, you know, obviously equality is at the center of any outcome that we want. Um, but um, but I, for my taste, I, I've, I've avoided the, the debate. Uh, my newspaper has former Middle East correspondent, uh, the Irish author Ed O'Loughlin, wrote a novel called Top Loader, which is set in a very thinly disguised Gaza Strip. But he did something that struck me at the time as very odd, but which I'm starting to understand. He gave all the characters living under occupation Western names. And I wanted to ask you, as a writer who chose to write about the Palestinians, do you find there are limits to how much you can get people to empathize with people who are Arab, Muslim, people called Abu Salama, people called Abu Farah? Do you ever find yourself having to argue for the common humanity of your subjects? Um, yes. Uh, absolutely. And this entire book is an exercise in attempting to overcome that. I mean, this whole book, the approach of doing narrative, uh, a work of narrative nonfiction, was to overcome that exact obstacle and to make people uh, empathize and to put themselves in the shoes of, of uh, ordinary people, ordinary people living in, under this uh, domination. To return for a moment to Q&A, <laughs> you were, to my knowledge, the first Western person, and I, forgive me, I don't want to harp on your identity, but it is there, um, to say on Australian mainstream media that the chief justification that has been given to us for the carnage in, Gal in Gaza, which is that Hamas must be destroyed, is not going to happen. That Hamas will still be in place would you like to elaborate on that? Sure. I mean, this isn't a, a controversial view. If you listen to any, um, you know, Israeli, even military commentator, um, not any, but many uh, respected ones, um, they will tell you, of course, it's an absurd uh, uh, goal. There is no elimination of Hamas, and I'm not just talking about the sense that course it exists as an idea and as a party and it will continue to exist in the West Bank and it will continue to exist uh, in the diaspora. No, it will continue to exist in Gaza. It's the, it, it was the strongest party uh, uh, in Gaza uh, prior to October 7th 
as soon as if you look at the areas of the north that Israel claims that it has uh, uh, conquered and, and mission accomplished in the north, uh, you know, as soon as uh, there was any chance to try and help people uh, get what little aid or food was there, who was doing it? It was the members of the former Hamas government who were coming out and trying to help people there. So they're still there even in the area that's that's been supposedly cleared. Um, and, and that will be true uh, uh, no matter what happens now, whether they do a, an operation in Rafa or they don't do an operation in Rafa. The only difference between uh, a ceasefire now and a ceasefire weeks or months from now is that uh, in both cases, Hamas will still be there. And in one case, you have thousands more uh, Palestinian civilians who will have been killed. You need to work on your hat. <laughs> Not a hat. <laughs> but, but, but it's a very good answer. So, uh, in a minute, we're going to open this up for questions. Um, but finally, I would like to ask you, Nathan. Um, on Q&A, when Jamal Rifi spoke, um, he said that Australia really can't do much on the global stage and that it should concentrate on improving intercontinental relations here at home. Um, what do you think Australians should be doing? Um, and is that a view you share, that they should concentrate on intercontinental relations at home? Um, and what should Australian media uh, speaking as a pra humble practitioner, be doing? What should we be doing? So, um, without knowing very much about uh, Australian domestic politics and, and media, I, I, I will say that I definitely uh, disagree with the notion that there's nothing that Australians can do, that uh, this is all in the US's hands, and uh, we're a close ally of the United States and we have to follow what the US is doing. No, there's a great room for countries like Australia, including Australia, to take concrete steps uh, to change the world, to change how this issue is dealt with throughout the world. Things like ensuring that pension funds are not investing in firms that are being used to commit war crimes in Gaza right now. Very, very simple. That would be a very important step, and if Australia would take it, it would be triply important, and it would send a message throughout the world, and it would open the door for others to do it, and to lead eventually the United States doing it. And more than that, I think that the time to do it is now. I think we, we often forget uh, that you know these moments, these wars, because this is when everybody's mobilized, this is when you can get tens of thousands in the street on uh, Palestine, you, can, you won't be able to do it uh, after a ceasefire, or not for very long after one. So if there are concrete steps to be taken, divestment from, uh, by pension firms, uh, funds from, uh, arms firms, uh, you know, th those steps need to be pushed for right now. This is the maximum chance that, that Australians have of putting those things through, and, and it's, it's, uh, it, it shouldn't be uh, neglected. It, it really needs to be uh, capitalized on. And, and I also think that, you know, it's not to answer the question more broadly than, than Australia. I think that there's really, it, it, it's inexcusable the degree to which so much of the world, which claims to care about Palestine, allows the United States to lead on this issue. And, uh, and to give just a one outrageous recent example, you know, the, the Biden administration um, decided now to sanction four violent settlers in the West Bank. And uh, it was an unprecedented step. There's no denying that had never happened before. The US imposing sanctions on Israeli citizens. And you know, 
there's every reason to criticize it. Uh, you know, obviously they're not going after the army. There are many more than four, uh, but it was a step that couldn't have been taken, I don't think, unless there was this mass mobilization for Palestine right now and the Biden administration built um, some heat and, and even talk of potentially is losing an election over being too pro-Israel, which is truly unprecedented uh, in, in US politics. But, but what happened after that? The day after that, the Europeans imposed sanctions on violent settlers too, a small handful. The Europeans all along, we've been told, America has the might, uh, America has the economic and military might, but Europe is the moral leader. Where is the moral leadership? You're waiting for America before you can sanction a few violent settlers? This is the lowest hanging fruit. So I think there is so much for Australians to do, so much for Europeans to do, and, and for others to do. Thank you. Thank you, Mahad and Nathan. Now we will open the floor to question time. I will hand over the microphone to those who have a question. Um, and uh, Mahad and myself will select the speakers. Um, so thank you, everyone. Okay, just in the front. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Sanctions 
and there was a, a boycott uh, movement around the world, and they were a moral pariah. And so uh, it's about creating structural conditions and not waiting for heroes, and neither on the Israeli nor the, the Palestinian side. I really believe that the structural conditions are, are what we should be focused on. Yeah. Apartheid since my teenage years. Okay. Uh, and what I find is. Is, that John? is there a question? Yeah, yeah, there is. Okay. Uh, what, what do you think would be the most effective way to stop this current slaughter and, and this, this, this ethnic cleansing? Because they're absolutely determined to drive um, Palestinians out of Gaza. And also the role of Egypt, I, I'm just wondering. <laughs> if you want to talk about how to stop it, I can talk about Egypt. <laughs> uh, okay. I, I'll, no, I'll no. trade you. Okay, no. <laughs> no, no, no. Okay, you can do both if you like. Um, I mean, the, the way to stop it is, uh, obviously, it, it needs to, there needs to be far more pressure than exists. Day. And and it has to come from people from their governments. And you know, if the U.S. were pushed, and they are feeling the pressure, there was a reason that they did sanctioning of four violent settlers. Uh, if if the U.S. were to say we're not going to give you arms to commit any more war crimes in Gaza, the war would be over yeah. immediately. So it's about uh, building of pressure and normalizing the the, um, the demands that are being made by the protest movement and growing these movements and really it's about uh, equal power and and, and and pressuring politicians and make, making clear to them they're going to be voted out of office for what they will this we will remember this and you are not going to be reelected. Yes, sir. I think when we talk about this, and when we talk about Egypt's role, and we talk about America's role, uh, I always think in terms of structures, two structures. The temporary jetty that I'm told the Americans plan to build, and the enormous concrete holding pen that the Egyptians are building on their side of the border. The Egyptians fear that the Palestinians are going to be cast out. They don't want them to become their problem, so they are already devising a containment system for them. Uh, Egypt has its own problems, and it has an insurgency in the Sinai that it's been fighting for many, many years, and it does not want to add 2.3 million Palestinians to its political problems. So it has created a structure. And these structures, everybody pretends to care about the Palestinians, and these structures are the physical manifestations of the pretense. If people really cared about the Palestinians, they would be fighting to keep them alive where they are. They would not be trying to devise artificial life support systems and weird temporary structures to help them. They would be fighting for them. And just to say, to add up on the pier, the pier is, is, is uh, just a, a huge embarrassment for the United States. Uh, and and it's, it's just absurd because you have uh, hundreds or thousands of trucks lined up waiting to enter Gaza right now. And there is no need for a fear. Uh, and it's, 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 
beyond uh, ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Mark asked a uh, question with two parts or two different questions. The first question is, do you think the Jewish people around the world were denied by Zionist and cooperation and colonization and used as a weapon? And that's why it created the Israel state and going down there and their victims as much as any other Palestinians get killed back in those times. We should be aware of that or not, that's question number one. Question number two, are you Australian, are you an Israeli citizen living there? And if it exists, who gives you the right to live there? Thank you. Um, so to take the second one first, no, I'm an American citizen only, uh, and I've been living there and working there as a journalist and um, um, a researcher for the International Crisis Group prior to, to from 2010 to 2020. Um, and in terms of the first question, I'm not sure that I uh, understood it correctly, but um, but I. Uh, you're, you're you're asking him whether or not the Jews have been used by the West as a kind of a beachhead. You said the U.S. Yeah. But you're what you're then basically saying is that Zionism was a kind of hoax perpetrated on Jewish people. Correct. Is that supportive or not? Um. <laughs> <laughs> I knew this would happen to me, me and my big mouth. Um, honestly, Azizi, this is, I mean, I think you have to accept uh, that the Zionist movement within Jewish life has its own agency, but it's also true that ever since the Zionist movement came into existence, it has had an accomplice. Uh, whether it was the British Empire or the American political establishment. And even before the British Empire, if we go back into the 19th century, before there was really a Zionist movement, I mean, there was the odd Jewish religious scholar here or there who felt that it was time for a new conception of how Jews could return to the Promised Land. There were people like Rabbi Kalisha and people like Rabbi Chaim Svi Schneerson who came to this country and fundraised for a return to the land in the 1850s and 1860s. Um, but even then, uh, Zionism had, an, or proto-Zionism if you want to call it that, had an accomplice in evangelical churches. Christian Zionism in some ways predates Zionism. And Christian Zionism taught, uh, certainly there was a Presbyterian preacher here, Adam Cairns, taught that the land is neglected, the land is empty. It's waiting for its proper owners to return. And they should return so that the end days can be brought closer. So I think Zionists were their own, they were actors in their own, they, they made their own history, but at the same time they were interacting with people and they took advantage of people, and those people took advantage of them, who had their own vision, who had their own agendas. Um, what was it Marx said, man makes history, but he, history is not, uh, you know, it's not always of his own making. I think there's a kind of, uh, there's a kind of backwards and forwards, but I think Israel is a creation of the Zionist movement, and I think you have to accept it on those terms. I don't think, I, I don't, I'm not inclined to think of the people who built the state of Israel as hapless victims of some giant Western conspiracy. This is not the exact question. The, the exact question the general Jewish, the ordinary Jewish, yeah. being used and being put this ideology in their heads, and they're the victim of that Zionism yeah. idea. Is that can be done? I, or? I, 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 I think that's. That's not a view I'd subscribe to. Yeah. Does mean you put everybody the same level? No, I think I think you have to. I think you have to. Ex I mean, I think Israelis and the Zionist movement are responsible for what we see now, mm. and I think that they have to be the. They have to be held chiefly responsible. Their allies are a different story. That's good. Okay, um, I, I'd just like to ask, um, have. As the panel or as uh, your journalist 
between the view of what the savage we were watched on in Al Jazeera and other television stations. Has there been any shift in the worldwide Jewish community, in the Melbourne Jewish community, in the United States Jewish community, towards an awareness uh, of what's happening? Um, I, I think that there is um, an enormous uh, rift in uh, diaspora uh, Jewish communities, and it's um, largely a generational rift, and that's also true beyond the Jewish community. There's a general generational rift in America itself, and um, and and I think that you know that will have very powerful and far-reaching long-term effects. Um, but the, the issue now, I, as I, to repeat myself, is really to try and uh, capitalize on it now when, when something, when much more can be done than can be done after a ceasefire. And, and the, um, the other thing I would say is we can't only look at um, the things that look like they're positive from the perspective of, um, of free Palestine. You, you also have to uh, be aware that for all of the awakening among younger people, there is also a strengthening of Zionism for many, uh, many uh, Jews in the diaspora, and October 7th is a confirmation for them of the necessity of a Jewish uh, state and they feel it more strongly than they ever felt it in their lives. So we have two different things happening at the same time, and it remains to be seen which is the more important and powerful effect, because one thing that I know is that in the past, those people who are now more uh, Zionist as, uh, than they were six months ago, they're gonna care a lot about this issue when every, all the crowds have gone home. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, I think this question is for my head probably more than um, yourself, Nathan, but yeah. today is um, there's a sign on in Brighton which says anti-Semitism is un-Australian. And so the history of our un-Australian comment, Nathan, is that any time we fight against racism or there's a big nationalist movement that uh, we're un-Australian when we oppose that. And so I, you've touched on some of the conversation around the, the growth of Zionism, white supremacy is happening all around Europe and around the world. And I suppose that when you are arguing, when you're pro-Palestine and you're arguing, you get accused of being anti-Semitic all the time in this country. And we see it from our government, we see it across all levels. I'm a teacher trying to organise in our workplace and doing those things. So I suppose what I wonder from your perspective is how do we effectively challenge the accusation of being anti-Semitic and um, anti-Semitism based on the fact that most of the people in the room here will un hopefully understand where I'm coming from on that. Look, I mean, as Nathan has said before, and I think he said on Q&A, in fact, um, there's a reason people accuse people of anti-Semitism, which is that it's a very powerful moral stigma. It's perhaps one of the most powerful moral stigma in our society. Uh, it's in the nature of Australian society and British society and Western society that what happened in World War II kind of defines the moral you know, I mean, we have this uh, saying that, you know, you can, you know, you know you've lost the argument when you have to resort to the analogy with Hitler. Um, but the fact is that Hitler, and what Hitler did, hovers over Western society always. And that is why anti-Semitism is such a charged accusation for people. Um, now, uh, people can say, oh, anti-Semitism is un-Australian. Uh, that's not my concern. I, I'm not interested in what is and it's not what Australian. Anti-Semitism is morally wrong. I know that. Um, and that's really all that, that, that matters. But what you're saying, and I, I hear the question, is how do we distinguish what we're trying to do 
from the accusation of anti-Semitism, which throws up so much smoke and so much moral stigma. Um, and I think the only way, I mean, uh, Nathan can, can you know, weigh in on this, I hope, is to stay focused on what it is we're about. We're about rights for Palestinians. Um, I remember many, many long years ago now, in 2001, um, I was put in charge of a demonstration uh, in Sydney. And uh, the demonstration in Sydney was outside a, an Israeli politician, Anand Vassin, who was Ariel Sharon's aide, uh, was in uh, Sydney fundraising. And some of the richest people in Sydney came to hear him talk. Um, and uh, I was demonstrating outside, and uh, a reporter from 10 News, John Hill, great big chap, came up to me and said, when are you going to burn the Israeli flag? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, uh, well, we're not going to burn the Israeli flag. We're going to hold up the Palestinian flag. I said, come on, mate. He said, when, they, when we opposed Vietnam, we burned the American flag. You guys are going to burn the Israeli flag. When are you going to burn the flag? I said, there's not going to be any Israeli flag burning. And he said, mate, if you don't burn an Israeli flag, my mate, and he pointed to his cameraman, is going to put the lens cap on, and there will be nothing on 10 News tonight. <laughs> I didn't know his name at the time, this reporter, by the way, John Hill, but then I saw him on Media Watch getting caned over something else, and I thought, that's the one <laughs> that asked me about the flag. Great big, he's, I think he's, he might be a Pacific Islander, I don't know, but he was huge. Um, and he was like, when are you going to burn the flag? And I said, we're not going to burn the flag. We're going to hold up, our job here is to raise the Palestinian flag. And our job, as, I mean, I'm a journalist, okay? <coughs> right? My job is to bring to people's attention what is happening there. Nathan wrote a book in which he drew attention to what is happening, but he didn't offer his own... But if you're an activist, if you're an activist, and if you are trying to get across to people the importance of the Palestinian people's rights, then what you have to do is hold up the Palestinian flag. Nobody is asking you to badmouth Jewish people. Nobody is asking you to, to foment conspiracy theories about Jewish people. But I will say this. People who say, oh, it's an absurd conspiracy theory to say that Jewish Americans have influence on American politics. I'm sorry, Sheldon Abelson is a real person. He was a real person. His wife is a real person. These people have real power. Uh, APAC is not a figment of my imagination, right? Um, so we have to be able to talk about real political things and name names. Where we have to draw the line is very simple. You cannot say the Jews X or the Jews Y. Or the, you know, the, as, soon as, as soon as you start doing that, as soon as you start talking in terms of categories, you open yourself up. But if you talk about this person here is preventing these people here from re realizing their rights, this person is putting money in to tip the scales, this person is building settlements. I mean, Jared Kushner and David Friedman actively fund settlements. Um, you are making a specific allegation. You're not trading in weird, you know, non-specific ideas about Oh, what went on here and what went on behind and what you can't see. We're talking about what you can see. It's known that this country, that universities in this country have tie-ups with Israeli defense establishment corporations. That's a real thing. That's not a conspiracy theory, right? It's known that Pine Gap provides signals intelligence that is fed back to the Israelis. This country is involved in the conflict. Yes, That's not a conspiracy theory. That's a fact that is as plain as the nose on your face, right? That's not all in some shadowy room there are people influencing people. That's something that's actually happening. And when you keep it on that basis, then your activism has a better chance. Of not only of succeeding, but of deflecting this accusation, which is always going to be present. I, I really have almost nothing to add to that. I, was, I, was, I agree with what you what you said, and I think it's very well said. Um, you know, I, I don't know to the extent to which the um, International Holocaust Remembrance Associations 
um, definition of anti-Semitism that's been an issue in Australia. Has. But, um, but you know, this is a definition of anti-Semitism that's been uh, promoted by pro-Israel groups um, uh, in Europe and the United States and around the world. And this definition of anti-Semitism is meant to protect Israel. It's meant to, uh, it virtually it outlaws Palestinian nationalism. It characterizes so much that falls under the category of legitimate criticism of Israel as anti-Semitic. And, um, and so, you know, I, I think that that is a trend that uh, in some ways you could, you know, if you really want to look at the glasses as half full, you could say that um, um, the fact of their, that pro-Israel groups are resorting to their weapon of last resort um, is a sign that they're losing the argument because it's really the last thing that you can say after you've lost every argument on substance over Israel-Palestine then you go and say, well, you're an anti-Semite. Um, but to answer the, the question that was asked, I think the most basic thing is to draw a distinction between criticism of Israel and Israel's domination of the Palestinians and criticism of Jews. It's just the, the most basic thing in the world. Anti-Semitism is hatred of Jews. And uh, criticizing Israel is not hatred of Jews. Uh, thank you, uh, my name is Nathan. Um, uh, yesterday, or the day before, um, Biden said, sometimes we need to protect Israel from itself. And at the same time, we see um, the continuous denial of the Palestinian rights, um, and like, I mean, by the Israeli uh, politicians and the Israeli society as well. Uh, and sometimes I think, as a Palestinian who come from Haifa, from Al Tantura in particular, I teach my kids that the right of return is something like a prey for us, and no one on earth can take it whatsoever. And we still can see the denial, and we still, uh, like sometimes I think, why the Israeli story that stupid, they think that seven million Palestinian in diaspora and two billion Muslims who actually dream they are not to, to pray under that golden dome. Well, stop dreaming, stop fighting to actually go back and return to their land and pray under this dome. So my question is, for how long do you think the denial will continue and the Israeli society will keep denying the Palestinian right? As long as it can. <laughs> as long as it can. And, 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 and yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's about political possibilities. And, and, and uh, you know, I also don't think that it's fair to say that they're delusional. The evidence so far is that they can do it indefinitely. Uh, not only that, but they can start normalizing with, with the UAE. My my love. When you talk about the two billion Muslims, when you talk about the seven million Palestinians, talk about their regimes, talk about the Saudis, talk about the Egyptians, talk about the Emiratis. Uh, when the Arab Spring came, I thought we are beginning, the change is beginning. And the change will still come, I believe. But, Shuan is how we do what are they doing? Nothing. What are they doing? What did they do in 2006 when Israel pounded Lebanon? They kept quiet for a long time, waiting to see who would win. When the Israelis started not to win, then they, they started to cry and, and shout. But they let uh, Nasrallah become popular because they were not willing to say anything. In 82, <coughs> when I was a child, I remember very well the poet Moen Sesu coming on TV and he read out his poem an open letter to Beaufort Castle. Rasalat al Maftuh had in al al And he said in it, say anything to us, but don't say one thing. Inna Arab. 
don't say we're Arabs. Do you know how painful that must have been for a Palestinian who believed in the other Arabs to say? It must have been horribly painful. It was painful for my father to hear. It was painful for me to hear. And I was a child, right? But the fact is that right now, the, all of the Arab regimes are pretending to care. If they really cared, they could do so much more. If they empowered their people, they could do so much more. So when Nathan says, as long as they can, he's talking about the horizon of political possibility. It's up to, it's up to people to make that horizon shorter. And after us too, right? Ah, yeah. after absolutely. us too. Absolutely, absolutely. Because we buy fucking submarines. So and everybody keeps me bloody mouth quiet. And this is the one example. Sure. And I chat my bloody mouth. Bless you. Okay. Talking, Do we talking want political possibilities. Is, it, is, it, is there any chance that they could be changed from within? I understand that the Yahoo is very unpopular, and can the Israelis themselves actually do anything to change what's happening? Where did that question come Sorry, I can't, I can't That'll be the final question, everyone. Is that the final question? Now we will Okay, we'll give one more after this one. Is there change from within, Micah? Come on, you live there. Tell me. Um, so it depends what kind of change you were talking about. Not can change. Can they change what's happening? It's possible. So, so if we're talking about change with respect to the domination of the Palestinian people, then the trend is in the opposite direction. More and more support for that. There are, as I said before, many divisions within Israel. There were huge uh, protests uh, that were going for a very long time, lasting up until uh, September, uh, that were largely about intra-Jewish issues, about how religious the future of the state would be. In many ways, that was the center of, of those protests. And, and those are real divisions, and they're real uh, passionately fought and felt issues. But if you look at the size uh, of the anti-occupation contingent within those massive protests, it was tiny. And these were protests about democracy. The whole headline of the protest was democracy, and 99% of the people in those protests were not thinking about you know, the fact that they don't live in a democracy. Uh, and, and so, you know, and, and many of them you know, we're doing Zoom classes at night about dem democracy and democratic theory and balances between judicial systems and parliaments. They were educating themselves, but that thought didn't enter their head. Um, so, um, so no, I don't. I don't see. I'm not optimistic about uh, internal change. Who's Who's gonna... Gonna... Uh, thank you very much for your very powerful presentation. Uh, I respect your uh, earlier comments uh, about your professional uh, concerns of not being the central historian of the end of the world. You, you, you turn this right, you want to make a story about told by, told by the subject of your work. My question is that you agree with the proposition that ultimately only the Palestinian people can determine what form of political governance they would wish to live under. Because at the moment, it seems to me that everybody else is trying to determine how Palestinians should be. Yeah. Well, yeah, I don't know. Is that a question? I mean, it's about self determination. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, well, I mean, in a way, the discussion about Hamas is intrinsically about this question, right? Do Palestinians have the right to choose how they are politically represented? In 2006, Palestinians elected Hamas. And the reaction of the international community was to shut Palestinian politics out of the system, right? Because Hamas was unacceptable. It was an unacceptable product. And in fact, a year later, George W. Bush attempted, with the help of Fatah and the Jordanian and Egyptian governments, to overthrow Hamas. And they succeeded in part. They overthrew them in the West Bank, but not in Gaza. Now, 
So ever since, we've had this situation where the entire Palestinian political life is in suspended animation, uh, in a cryogenic state, and nobody's allowed to unfreeze it, right? Now, uh, you, and then you say you can unfreeze it, but as long as there's no Hamas. Well, I'm, I'm sorry. If there is not Hamas, there has to be some other entity that expresses the tendency that Hamas represents. When I talked a moment ago about the Sesu, the Sesu's poem came out of the realization that the Palestinian nationalist project represented by Fatah and the Arab nationalist project that underpinned that project had failed. They had failed to save Palestinian lives. They had failed to turn back the tide of uh, Israel and so on. Um, and then it was natural that people would look in another direction. And Hamas was part of that process. <coughs> I mean, I can't help thinking that after all the carnage we've seen in Gaza, there is a real possibility that a more radical Palestinian party than Hamas will come to the fore. Because after 1982, before 1982, the Shia in Lebanon were represented by a movement called Amal. And Amal was radical, but it wasn't militant. After 82, Hizm Allah came. What Israel got in return for the 82 invasion was Hizm Allah. And now they go, Hizm Allah, somebody has to help us with Hizm Allah. You are the ones who radicalized the Shia in the South. So, uh, yes, and they count on it to some extent. They count on it. But the fact is that it's true that Palestinians have to determine. I mean, Paul, as you said, talking about one state and two states right now is like designing the interior of a house you don't even have a plan for. Uh, you don't even have a building permit for. Uh, Pal only Palestinians can determine how Palestinians should live. Yeah. Absolutely. I agree. Um, this will be the end of the discussion. Um, I'd like to thank Nathan and Paul and Mahan Mugabe for joining us today. Uh, Before we <laughs> can I, can I, I'm sorry, mate, I have to do this. This is a gorilla, this is a completely unscripted thing, okay? I'm sorry. We're in the State Library tonight, and, and I want to very quickly, if I may, uh, read a poem by one of the State Library Three, as I'm calling them. I started this term. Yes. Um, the three, poets been, the three poets who've been told that they cannot teach in this building uh, because of cultural and child safety reasons. Uh, so one of the poets, the other two poets are Jinghua Chan, who I hope I spelled, co pronounced her name reasonably correctly, and Alison Evans, and I would like to pay tribute to both of them. Um, but this is a poem by the third poet, Omar Sape, and it's called um, Workshop Borders, and it's dedicated to Alan Kurdi, the little boy who died on the beach, uh, and the unknown multitudes. I tell the students to write using only images. For example, a mile of sand glistened. Waves wash each grain blue. A small boy lies between the two. When I say a small boy, we all picture the same child, the one who died, the one closest to us. I fear the power of the image, how it changes nothing except myself, how it is never just an image, how the boy lives now under my bitten fingernails, how I live inside his grave, the great uncaring blue wound of the world. I have been told to be more specific. Is the blue A, a C, B, a chlorinated pool C, an I? I tell the students, language paves the way to every death. Be careful with your rhetoric, especially when it feels right. We cannot be picturing the same child. We lack the imagination. We never saw him, not his life or his headline. We looked away to practice self-care. The timeline is too dark. Netflix and erasure. A deluge of icons and canned laughter and bright graphics and that boom sound 
that lets us forget there have been many more children dead in riverbanks or swallowed by the ocean, unphotographed in the desert, blown to pieces in war zones, or caged by we, the civilized West, land of the damned free. I tell the students to move me and hope they cannot hear the desperation. Teleportation is all any of us truly desire, to move and be moved in complete stillness, collapsing distances with a word, a shriven glance, an image of a poet, in this case a man, bearded, Arab, I mean kind of dusky, a faded beaten sky surrounded by students, pale and dark and bored and solemn and on their phones, because this is important and so not. And their rickety peeling tables form a square around the man, his vain efforts at peeling back the ocean, the seething black and green, the froth and heave of it, to cradle the boys and girls that never got to be so alive as to be bored by a poem. The rugged magic of rhythm given form. La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. And doing his best, I swear his best, to be professional, to not put his head on the damp shifting sand and beg the waves to sun. purchase his book, we will have it available for you and he will be able to sign it for you, which is a wonderful treat and thank you Nathan. A quick reminder, we have the weekly protest every single Sunday at 12pm in front of the State Library. They are continuing through the month of the Ramadan, however they will be slightly shorter to support those who are fasting throughout the day and through the terrible heat we've been experiencing. And for some of you who are, quite, who are interested, um, in protesting Australia's ties to weapons manufacturers, we do have community pickets formed, um, two in particular. One is in uh, Campbellfield, the HTA uh, picket on Thursday, the 14th of March and the 15th of March. You will find them on Free Palestine Lives and Socials, so please have a look and join. There will also be another one on the 14th in Rosebud. So for those of you who feel as committed as we are um, in uh, protesting Australia's complicity in this genocide, Please join us in our community picket on Thursday and Friday and also.